Okay. Howdy, this is a presentation about mini satins. You're kind of hanging out in my rabbitry with me for a lot of these pictures. So let's uh, take a look at the next slide. That's a very important slide. Oh, that's me. So there's some stuff about me. Uh, if you get a chance to go back, if you're really curious, you can go back and check it out later. Uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time on me. Um, but uh, suffice it to say that I've had about 45 years of experience with either big satins or mini satins. So I'm pretty familiar with the breed. Next slide. Um, super brief history, uh, mini satin history. Um, we've got more important things to talk about today than the history, but I think it's important that uh, you know that originally uh, they were started as Netherland Dwarfs and they were called Satinettes. Uh, they've been around since at least 1970. People fiddled around with them for about 20 years or so. Um, and then from 1994 to about 2000, Jim Krahulik, I think he's from uh, Indiana or Illinois, uh, he changed the name to Mini Satin and actually presented them to the ARB Standard Committee. And then in 2005, J. Leo Collins from Ohio um, got a hold, of, you know, got the CD. It came to him, uh, and he presented three varieties in 2005. And ultimately, whites, well, maybe 2003, something like that. Anyway, whites were uh, ultimately approved in 2005, and Leo introduced uh, Florida whites. So at least three breeds have been part of the development of the of the mini satin, uh, the Netherland dwarf, um, small. Uh, sized big satins, and then uh, Florida whites. And uh, since 2005, we've added a total of 15 additional varieties. Uh, there's only one variety that currently has a certificate of development, and that's the Sable mini satin. Uh, that was um, exhibited for the first time in Reno in 2019. Next slide. Um, that's a chart that you can find on the American Satin Rabbit Breeders website. Um, it just shows the 16 varieties of uh, approved mini satins currently. Uh, there's a bunch of them. Next slide. So um, we'll start with the weights. Um, it's a four class breed. So senior bucks and senior does are six months in age and over. Um, they have the same weights, three and one quarter pounds is the minimum weight, four and three quarter pounds is the maximum weight, ideal weight, four pounds. Junior bucks and does, um, again, same weight range. Uh, they're under six months of age. The maximum weight is four pounds. Minimum weight is two pounds. Uh, good idea if you're showing them not to bring them to shows uh, until they weigh at least two pounds. They get two pounds at about 10 to 12 weeks. Um, but bringing them um, earlier than that uh, kind of isn't fair to the rabbit. If the juniors do exceed the maximum weight, they can bump up to the senior class. And the one, the kind of an oddity about this breed is that the young rabbits rush up to about four pounds and they get four pounds pretty quickly or you know, three and a half to four pounds pretty quickly. And then they seem to really slow down in growth. Um, the club raised the maximum weight of juniors um, at the last standard by a quarter of a pound just to adjust for that. But it's odd that they rush up to that weight real quick and then um, slow down. Sometimes they actually have their full um, senior weight at five pounds. Next slide. Schedule of points. This is uh, an important um, point um, in the the schedule of points really is instruction to both breeders uh, for culling, uh, breeders for selecting rabbits, and also for judges in terms of what the priorities are. Um, this is a heavy type breed uh, in the sense that it's heavy on type. Um, general type, body type, and general type is more than two times more important than fur. Uh, and it's five and a half times more important than color. Um, so it's very heavy on type points. Uh, the next uh, big thing about the breed, of course, is the fur, the satinized fur, and then color and condition at 10 points apiece. And that really speaks a lot to the priorities in terms of both judging and selecting rabbits and classes, but also in terms of culling and keeping rabbits uh, in your rabbitry. Next slide. So we'll start with body type. Um, 
45 points on body type again, almost two times the, the amount of points that are put on fur, four and a half times more important than color in terms of uh, those priorities. We're talking about a short, close coupled, compact breed uh, with well developed shoulders, well developed hindquarter, a uh, depth that approximately equals the width. Uh, comes pretty close in terms of measuring the width uh, from the shoulder, rib cage, and hindquarter on back. Um, the depth at all those um, points in the top line should equal the width. It's a gradual rise to the top line from the ear base to the hip center. And then at the turn of the hip, uh, turn of the hip, which is at the peak point, uh, then it curves um, in a very smooth uh, curve to the base of the tail. So um, next slide. The top line is a big deal. There's a lot of talk about top lines right now. So I'm going to say some of those things again, actually. Uh, the top line refers to the shape of the side profile from the neck to the tail base. It starts on a real short, deep neck right at the base of the ear. There's a gradual rise and the deeper the shoulder, the more gradual the rise uh, to the peak point, which is at the center of the hip. And again, then it turns the hip and falls smoothly in a curve uh, to the base of the tail. And you can measure these rabbits and I suggest you do until you really figure out what that shape looks like. Uh, you can measure them at the shoulder, set them on a ruler. Uh, you can measure them at the shoulder, you can measure them at the hind quarter. And then you'd come up with a pretty close measurement when you're um, you know, measuring from the table to the top point of the shoulder, the top point of the hip. And I encourage you to do that um, so that you really get a feel for what, what to look for and what, what shape that is. Okay, go ahead. This is a slide that um, Joe Kim and Amanda Wapner used at the Rabicon presentation at the 2019 convention. And uh, my appreciation to them for letting me use it and to the artist for drawing it. Um, but it shows um, two different versions of the top line. Um, and really the discussion, discussions about top lines are not new. I, when I got into Rabbis in the 1970s uh, through the 1980s, we had a bunch of magazines, the Rabbit and KV Gazette, uh, Rabbits Magazine, Small Stock Magazine. And many of the uh, writers were the top breeders in the country, and they were talking about depth of body, the top line and peak point, uh, much like breeders are today. And uh, part of the discussion is where that, exactly where that peak point is, uh, what's that turn of the hip look like, um, how steep should the rise be. Uh, and then there's this thing that keeps hanging on about uh, rabbits um, that have a commercial style type. And even though this is a, a compact rabbit, it does have a commercial style. And uh, we'll talk more about that in a bit. But um, the myth is that they should look like a half a basketball. The, uh, the picture that you're looking at, um, the lighter line, kind of the red, orange, pink line, whatever it looks like on your screen, is the wrong top line. Um, that rabbit peaks right in the middle of the back. It's the most common fault for many satins. It's, one, it's a very difficult thing to do uh, to have a rabbit that's short and compact and have that top line be in the correct spot, which is over the center of the hip. The green line is um, the kind of top line that you can achieve uh, on Californians, New Zealand's uh, satins, big satins, uh, commercial style breeds. Um, it's not easy, but it certainly can be done. Uh, I think there'd be some debate about mini satins, whether or not that's too steep a rise uh, and whether or not you should have a little more gradual rise, maybe a peak point that's just a trace earlier and a smoother kind of curve to the base of the tail. I think that's uh, certainly a worthy discussion. But the point here is that um, you've got a lot of depth of body on these rabbits when, when they're right, uh, especially at the peak point and also at the shoulder, good deep shoulder and that they do not look like a half a basketball. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about that again with uh, some more slides uh, coming up. Next slide. And this is an example, again, uh, kind of give you some sense of uh, peaking too early. Uh, the, the slide on the left is a rabbit that peaks right in the middle of the back, doesn't carry its step body far enough into the loin, 
to finish out the top line properly. And that rabbit probably does look like a half a basketball, but it's the wrong body type for many sides. Um, the slat on the right actually has a peak point that's later than the center of the hip. Uh, and what you're seeing is a, a turn of the hip that's very dramatic. Um, it, it sort of slams to the ground almost. It doesn't, uh, that's not a smooth gradual curve. That's a, an abrupt slide off of a mountain kind of, kind of thing. So you wind up with a rabbit that's undercut or chopped. Uh, and that's what that um, comment refers to when judges use it at the chop time quarter as a rabbit that's peaking uh, pretty late in the game and doesn't have a lot of fullness at the base. Uh, next slide. That's the rear view. And uh, this is another example of why it doesn't look like uh, uh, a half of a basketball. When you've got depth that equals width and the, the slide on the right, the white rabbit, uh, has a little bit better um, shape to the back of the hind quarter than the rabbit on the left. Um, you've got an upside down U. So it doesn't look like a, a basketball at all. It looks like an upside down U. And again, if you measure that white rabbit, um, measure the, it at the base on the outside of the hips and then measure how deep it is, that's very close to being the same measurement. The rabbit on the left is a pretty good rabbit too, but you can see just a little bit of hollowing as you um, look at the, where the loin connects with the top of the hip. There's just a little bit of hollowing there. Um, that should be a little little more filled in so that it's rounder through the back of the hind quarter. <clears throat> but that's what depth that approximate width, as approximates width looks like from the hind end. And it, the shape should be an upside down U. Uh, next slide. Um, taper. Interestingly enough, the mini satin standard doesn't describe taper. Uh, I think that's uh, something they need to attend to in the future. But Here's two views of taper, and taper is the sideline profile of the rabbit. Um, it should be wider in the hind quarter, a little bit narrower in the shoulder. Uh, there should be a, a slight increase in width. I would argue that the rabbit in the right slide has really too much taper. It's got a, quite a narrow shoulder and kind of bulges out a little bit in the midsection. The rabbit on the left has a better taper until you get to the very base of the hind quarter and that rabbit's just a little bit pinched at the base. Um, it shouldn't uh, come together uh, quite that much um, at the, the base of the hind quarter. But that's what good taper looks like. The one on the left, it's a gradual uh, increase in width from the shoulder to the hind quarter. It should not look like a piece of pie. That's too much taper. It shouldn't look like a triangle. Um, next slide. Those drawings are taken out of the standard of perfection. That's just a screenshot on one of the pages in the, uh, the SOP. Um, that's going to be in the upcoming SOP as well. Um, you can see from the drawing on the right uh, that, again, if you measure the base of that rabbit to the top of that rabbit, the depth and the width are equal. Uh, and it shows a slight increase in the drawing on the left uh, in width from the shoulder to the um, to the high quarter. That's what good taper and that's what um, a good top line looks like from the back end. So, and it's also the other thing that's important is that it's real rounded over the top. If you remember that black rabbit, uh, I think it was the last slide, had a little bit of a hollowing. Uh, and so it didn't have that kind of roundness that you see in the, in the right um, try. Go ahead with the next slide. These are just typical type faults. Um, if you've raised rabbits for a while, uh, you'd be familiar with most of those terms. Um, I think probably the most you know, the important thing is the, uh, um, the statement on the bottom in bold, and that's that the most common type fault in many saddens is peaking too early. Um, you can certainly have all of those other typical faults that can be pinched they can be chopped off at the hind quarter. They can be narrow in the shoulder, flat in the shoulder. Their hips can protrude a bit, especially if you have a lot of hollowing on the side of the loin or a very low loin. Um, they can be rough. Um, they can be very fine in bone. Even, there's, even though they're small, they should have enough bone to really um, to set them up and so that they can withstand the rigors of, of um, you know, producing litters and so forth. So you can have rabbits that are dwarfed and too fine in bone. 
but the most common fault is the peak early. It's kind of tough on a short rabbit. It's easy, a little bit easier to put a proper top line on a rabbit with a little more length. But we're talking about a short couple rabbit with a, a tight shoulder. And uh, so it's a little bit tougher to do. And that's pretty obvious from uh, judging rabbits all around the country and seeing how many of them can't get that peak point uh, proper over the center of the hips. Go ahead. So um, I don't know, one of the ways to think about type, uh, there's so many breeds, we just approved the 50th breed and if the ARBA Board of Directors approves it, it will be, become the 50th breed and it's Dwarf Papillon. So it's a lot of breeds, uh, may seem kind of overwhelming, but I would argue that a great many breeds in the standard have very similar body type. And even though the mini satin is a compact rabbit, a short close coupled rabbit, um, it very much has a commercial style type. Um, if you understand New Zealand type or satin type or Rex type, um, the mini satin has types that's pretty much the same. The difference is it's a smaller rabbit, it's shorter, more compact, a little lighter weight, but the shape is essentially the same. The standard descriptions are remarkably similar to uh, commercial rabbits. They're posed the same as commercial rabbits. And there's just a, a couple of, a few examples at the bottom of that slide, but there are many more uh, rabbits that have um, this kind of type. And the next slide I think demonstrates that. I am certainly not gonna sit here and read all these things to you. Uh, but when you get a chance um, to take a look at this presentation later on, when you have a little more time, you might read all the information in those boxes. What I try to do is take a uh, commercial rabbit in New Zealand and take a look at the major components of the rabbit, shoulder midsection, loin, hindquarter, taper, depth, and top line, and then take a look at how those things are described in other standards, and I chose the mini rats, the mini set, and the Havana. They're all small, relatively compact rabbits, but the description of the shoulders, midsection, loin, hindquarter, taper, depth, and top line are remarkably similar. They use a lot of the same words. Uh, they expect the same peak points. Um, you know, talk about well-filled, well-rounded, you know, et cetera, firm, um, and so forth. So take a look at uh, take a look at that slide when you get a chance later and uh, spend some time with it or just get out the standard of perfection and take a look at those, read those type descriptions. They are remarkably similar. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> head and ears, there's 10 points on head and ears in this uh, breed. Um, so I'm showing you three heads here. Um, they need to be a little bigger and bolder um, then you have on uh, some other smaller compact rabbits. You're looking for a shorter, stockier ear that's got some substance to it. If they get much over three inches, you, you can get them to three and a half inches. That's allowable. But if you get them much over three inches, um, they're going to look a little bit more like a, a miniature commercial head and, and ear than um, a mini satin head and ear. So you've got a little bit broader head, a fuller muzzle shorter, stockier um, ear with some substance to it, uh, well furred. And those two little guys in the bottom are kind of what um, many satin heads look like, good heads uh, when they grow up, that's what they look like when they're uh, quite a bit smaller. So that completes the type section there, I think. So the next slide is, oh, the bottom line with regard to type, uh, that makes sense. So the, the picture is taken off that chart that I showed you earlier from the uh, um, uh, American Satin Rabbit Breeders website. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, what's it take to win at the, you know, in good competition in national classes. Um, and the first thing you have to have is superior type over all other characteristics. If you don't have superior type, um, you're not going to be in the, in the top holes of a great big class at a national show with all the best breeders in the country. And if that's where you want to compete, the first thing you have to do is make sure that you have really good typed rabbits. That's where the points are, 55 points. And it's more important than anything else um, that you're looking at. 
You've also got to have top lines that peak properly. Those rabbits that peak in the middle of the back are gonna, they're gonna go off um, in the middle of the classes, even if they have great coats of fur and are, are real good otherwise. Uh, they aren't gonna be competitive with rabbits that have those deeper top lines that peak properly. You've got to have a smooth turn of the hip to the base of the tail. That's that roundness and fullness through the back of the hind quarter. You've got to have a smooth taper. You can't have, you know, narrow shoulders and then pop out in the middle of the rib section and, and carry on with the, with the sideline. It's got to have um, a good kind of short coupled, uh, smooth taper, slightly narrower in the shoulder, a little bit wider in the hip, but a very smooth sideline to it. And you've got to have roundness over the top. If you take your hand, the back here, if you pose the rabbits uh, with the head to your left hand and the rear end to your right hand, and then take your right hand, the back of your right hand, and run it over the top of the rabbit so that you, you stay in contact with the rabbit all the way around, all the way to the other side of the rabbit to the base. That should be a very smooth feel all the way. And again, if you take your pose the same way, if you take your hand, put your fingers on the table on the, the far side of the rabbit, and then bring your hand around to the back of the hind quarter and with your fingers never leaving the table. That should be a very smooth, there shouldn't be any angles to that feel. Um, that's the best uh, hind quarter, the best body type uh, that you hope for all the time. And then of course, depth that approximates width from the shoulder midsection through the hind quarter. So, those are the rabbits that are at the top end. Those are the rabbits that are competitive in the big varieties for best of variety and ultimately for best of breed in, in the mini satins. Next slide. So the next most important thing is fur. It's a big deal. It's a unique kind of fur, it's a satinized fur. Um, it's got a hollow hair shaft. It reflects light. That's why the color is so intense on it. And there are basically six things that you can say about fur in general. Density, texture, balance, length, sheen, or some word that describes luster if it's a different breed, uh, and condition. The defining characteristics for the mini satin breed are texture and sheen, but the standard doesn't give you any direction in terms of which of those characteristics is the most important. It does talk about a very dense coat, very dense undercoat, a very dense coat in general. Uh, that gets three mentions in the description of the uh, satinized coat. And next you have texture. Uh, that actually gets five mentions. And it, there are three words that are used to describe that very soft coat. Silky, fine, gets uh, used twice. Soft gets used twice. So five mentions that um, infer softness. In words that I've heard people in, uh, use to describe satin texture, uh, and I've used uh, many of them myself, and that's that it should feel like silicone, very smooth. And when you stroke the fur from the hind quarter up to the shoulder, it should be very, very smooth. Uh, it's almost like running your hand over soft butter. I've heard some people talk about it as, it's like feeling air. There's no drag in the coat. There's no grainy feel to the coat. The guard hair is slightly coarser, but keep in mind that slightly coarser on a very soft coat is still very soft. So you, know, you should feel the resistance of the guard hair when you stroke it from the hind quarter to the shoulder but it should not feel grainy. There should not be a drag to it. It should not be significant resistance uh, that you can really feel and really pick up. Balance is just the balance of all the other characteristics. The length, the texture, the density, you know, is uh, the density similar uh, over the course of the coat? Is the texture similar over the course of the coat? Uh, or is it, you know, harsh in some areas and, you know, fine and soft in other areas? Uh, the length of the coat should be uniform. Uh, that's how you're going to get your uh, best return uh, when you stroke the the, um, uh, the fur from the high quarter to the neck. It should uh, return and lie smoothly over uh, over the pelt, uh, go back to its natural position. So it should be uniform. Um, shorter, just from a breeder standpoint, um, what I've found over many years is that coats that are slightly shorter. Uh, with that great texture and good density, 
Uh, they tend to finish quicker and they tend to fit, stay finished longer. And kind of what you're looking for is a, what I call a wash and wear coat. It's the kind of coat, it finishes at 10 weeks and you almost don't notice it ever going into molt from 10 weeks on. Uh, those are the best coats, uh, they stay in the best condition. Um, every rabbit molts, but the ones that don't molt very much or molt very quickly are the ones that you wanna hang on to for breeders. Those are the ones that you're looking for in terms of improving your coat. Sheen, of course, is that um, characteristic that makes it all shiny. Other breeds have different words like luster and gloss and so forth. Um, the sheen on, on um, satinized rabbits uh, comes from a, um, a hollow hair shaft that reflects light. And it's especially noticeable in white, the, the white portions of the coat or cream portions of the coat because it, it turns those coats ivory in good light. Um, they have an ivory gloss to them, they have a yellow, kind of a yellow tint to them. And if you pick the rabbit up in, in your hands and then move it from one place to another in the light, that yellow kind of ivory look actually changes where it is on the rabbit because it's actually reflecting the light uh, in the room, whether it be in the natural sunlight or the light above your judging table or whatever it might be. Um, years ago, we had judges who actually disqualified animals for that yellow cast. I think we've pretty much gotten rid of that, convinced uh, both breeders and judges around the country that that yellow cast is critically important to the breed. Uh, and it's, it's an indication that the uh, rabbit has real high sheen. And then condition, uh, the guard here gives that body, that, the body to the coat and re resilience without coarseness, resilience without coarseness. Uh, and again, it must return to its natural position by smoothly over uh, the pelt when stroked from the hind quarter to the head. And once again, texture and sheen are the breed defining characteristics. Those are the things that set um, satinized fur apart. And so you're looking at a white, kind of an ivory white there, and you're also looking at the belly color of a, um, an otter rabbit in the up, upper picture. So that's what sheen kind of does to the color. Go next slide. A little more about fur, and that's actually a film. Um, so you could, David, you could play the film if you want. There you go. That's somebody's hand stroking that coat. So there's some things that you're noticing there as, uh, as that film happens. And you can play that in a loop if you want or just keep playing it while I'm talking. Um, you don't see any skin. You notice that? It's all fur to the base. Yeah, that's a coat that has enough density. Um, Dilutes in general have better texture than uh, some of the others. So blues in particular have great texture, but lilacs have it. Uh, some of the, uh, the blue versions of agoutis and so forth have great texture. Uh, absence of sheen is a disqualification in the breed. Um, typically that comes from crossbreeding them to normal furred rabbits, uh, Havanas, Florida whites, or what have you. You'll occasionally see a rabbit that um, has normal fur. Um, we already talked about sheen given the white fur and a, a yellow or ivory cast. Um, the return of the coat should have no significant resistance to it. It's more of a rollback coat than a flyback coat, although rollback is not a term used in the standard, uh, but it's more similar to a rollback coat than a flyback coat. If you have a really quick return, and we have a film later on of a different rabbit that has a much quicker return, that's a, a rabbit that has less density and probably is a little bit too harsh in texture, has a little bit too much tensile strength in the guard hair so that uh, it returns a little bit quicker. The bottom line is the rabbits that have really high quality finished fur with superior texture and high sheen um, and at least adequate density. And I would say that adequate density is a density that at least covers the skin so that when you stroke it from the hind quarter of the, to the shoulder, you're not seeing uh, you know, a lot of skin in the crease of the fur. So those rabbits that have, uh, you know, Good finish, great texture, sheen, and at least adequate density. Those rabbits really stand out in competition. So. Next slide. Color, um, 10 points. Um, 
the tort that's um, that you see in the picture was the one was the youth rabbit that was the best uh, mini satin at the Marks Virtual Convention here uh, last week or so. Um, belongs to a young fellow by the name of DJ Hoff. I think it's a young fellow. I don't know that I've met him. Um, DJ Hoff from Minnesota and a beautiful rabbit, gorgeous rabbit. I got the judging, so I'm partial to that rabbit in particular. So uh, colors, 10 points. Um, we have 16 varieties. We have 13 individual varieties. Well, I, I miscounted. We have 11 individual varieties. I'm gonna have to change the slide there because 13 and five don't make 16. Um, but we have five groups and the torts that you're looking at there uh, in that upper picture, um, that's one of the groups. So they can be shown in all four colors. Otters can be shown in all four colors as can Siamese and Brokens of course are a group and Silver Martins are a group. Sheen makes the color on these set rabbits uh, more brilliant uh, than similar colors with normal fur. And, and if you get a chance in a showroom to take a copper mini satin or copper big satin and compare it to a chestnut agouti, those are the same colors, but they look remarkably different because of the sheen. Uh, you can do the same thing comparing a tort like this to a cinnamon or uh, comparing a tort to a tort mini rex, just a remarkable difference in the intensity of the color. Again, it creates an ivory or yellow cast in whites. And again, uh, sheen is one of the breed defining characteristics. Um, one of the color problems with the breed is most of the colors you can tell very easily if they're satinized or if they're normal furred. Um, very easy in whites or brokens. Otters are very easy. You look at the belly color. Um, very easy to tell. Most of Goody is the same way. Um, blacks, however, present one heck of a problem because you can have very soft uh, coated Havanas, for example, um, and you can have very harsh coated mini satins. Um, so texture uh, is not the definitive difference. Um, if you can find a white hair, and it's um, pretty common in black rabbits to be able to find a white hair, if you can find a white hair, you can tell with confidence that the animal is either um, a satin or a, a normal furred rabbit uh, because that normal furred white hair is just stark white and a, a white satinized uh, hair is um, shiny and yellow. You can also, uh, if you can't find a white hair, you can take a look at the belly and many times um, you can tell uh, from the belly color whether or not it's satinized and you may be able to differentiate it that way. But uh, if you're judging them, um, I'd be real careful making the call if you can't find the white hair or uh, you can't tell from the belly color. Um, because again, you can, even though Havanas have different head and ears uh, than many satins and, you know, hopefully in ideal situations, different texture, um, you can have many satins that have poor head and ears, uh, longer, narrower heads, longer ears. And uh, that's gonna make it real tough to tell. So tough to make that call sometimes. Um, the other point I wanna make is that, you know, color is important, but I think sometimes it get, gets overemphasized by both judges and breeders. Um, I know a lot of times when I get asked questions about mini satins, breeders are asking questions about color. You know, they're worried about the uh, intermediate ring on their chins or the intermediate ring on their coppers or the shading on their Siamese or frustrated because they'll put you know, lighter Siamese and they'll get kind of knocked down in classes or they'll put darker Siamese and the same things will happen. The same thing will happen. The same thing happens with torts. And those colors are more complex without a doubt. I mean, I, um, we're going to talk a minute about copper color. Um, so you take a look at the complexity of it. But the bottom line is there are 10 points on color, whether it's a, a copper or a chin or a Siamese, same number of points as uh, color on white rabbits. And, uh, you know, when was the last time you, you heard anybody say, well, you know, this white's going to lose uh, in this class because of its color? And it doesn't happen. You hear that a lot with, uh, with uh, colored rabbits. And, and sometimes it's perfectly appropriate. It makes sense. But I think when you have rabbits that are within a range of normal color, um, and you're judging rabbits on the table, if they're within the range, 10 points ought to be, uh, you know, that's a tiebreaker. Uh, if they've got 
perfectly matched type and perfectly matched fur, then it makes perfect sense to, to make a call on color. But it's unusual that they would have perfectly matched type and perfectly matched fur. So, um, you know, it just, it shouldn't be overemphasized. And, and as a breeder, getting all wound up about color, unless you have great body type and great quality fur, um, those should be your first concerns. Uh, as long as you have color that don't have, you know, colors that don't have significant color faults, really, things that really detract and, and are uh, horribly, uh, you know, uh, apart from the standard description. If you've got a range of color that's perfectly acceptable, you really need to concentrate on, on type and on fur first. So next slide. Um, general faults and DQs with regard to color. Um, I tried to show you some bad color there in those pictures. Uh, you're looking at an unfinished young otter. It looks like he has four feet, uh, four foot tall ears. That's a function of the photograph, actually. <laughs> His ears aren't that tall. But he does have an unfinished coat that's very dull in color uh, and very uneven in length and so forth. You've got a broken in the top right picture that's got a lot of color on the ear. Uh, boy, you can breed that into your herd in a heartbeat. Um, you should not, not do that. <laughs> um, keep rabbits that have good solid colored ears and, and pretty good markings to them. Uh, upper left side, you've got an otter that has no undercolor at all. Uh, we're going to talk about otters in a minute, so we'll let that go, but that's what that looks like uh, when an otter doesn't have any undercolor on the belly. And then the lower um, left-hand picture is a wide band copper, and that's a copper that ha that's a copper that has no um, slate blue undercolor on the belly. Uh, it's just got an ivory uh, belly. And what happens with the intermediate the intermediate band is that it's really wide on top. Typically, the 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 um, proportion of ring, um, the base ring, the slate blue ring should be the widest ring. The intermediate ring should be the next widest, and then the upper color should be a relatively uh, thin band of color. Uh, in these wide bands, they call them that for a reason. Uh, and it, they're in combination with having no belly color, under color on the belly. Um, but some of the things that you're going to find in general um, faults in many satins, you're going to find marbled eyes or wrong colored eyes. And it's not uncommon at all. Um, people cross colors. Um, we, in the last standard, um, allowed, as many breeds did, thanks to some excellent research by Jack Etnar, um, who discovered that marbled eyes were, were normal for uh, chin rabbits and shared that with uh, the then ARB Standard Committee. So a number of uh, standards changed their uh, chin standards to allow for marbled eyes. So we allow them, and if you're breeding them to blacks or blues or uh, you know other colors, uh, you're gonna not only share color genes, you're gonna share um, you know, eye color genes as well. So you get them from color crosses a lot. Um, as is typical with the lutes, you'll get some mismatched nails. Uh, you'll occasionally find those in the darker colors, blacks and, and so forth, but uh, typically it's the lutes. You'll find mismatched nails in particular. Um, the middle nail tends to be the weaker nail, although you can find the mismatched really dark nails or light nails on other parts of the foot as well. Uh, and comparing it to the dew claw, the dew claw many times is really black, really dark, and then the nails are really light. Um, that would, it's a judgment call, but that would amount to mismatched nails in many cases. You'll find unrecognized colors, and you'll find those most in the brokens. I mean, you're not going to, it's pretty obvious if somebody's shown a lilac, a lilac, which is not recognized currently in the breed, um, that's a pretty obvious call. But it, a lilac uh, broken is not so obvious. Uh, and I've seen steel brokens pass many times um, as if they're an agouti uh, variety. Uh, Kenny McCracken showed me one some years ago that had won a bunch of uh, best of breeds and best of shows. And it was clearly a steel broken. Um, you'll get too light color, too blotchy color. You'll get uh, stray white hair as it's uh, you get ticking and mealiness. Sometimes you get ticking in blues, which is odd. You get mealiness on otters, um, especially if they don't have that good undercolor in the belly. Uh, you get some, a lot of tan mealiness up on the heads. Uh, you get the lack of good shadings in the torts and Siamese. 
uh, wrong undercolor. Um, opals, um, check the opals. If whether you're a breeder or a judge, you know, check those opals because they can have the wrong undercolor. For sure, we've got some other op opal um, things that we call opals in the standard and other breeds um, that actually allow for white undercolor. Um, uh, ours doesn't. Uh, red rabbits, because they're bred to coppers or goodies, will have wrong undercolor on their lower hips many times. And those same colors will have really dark blue color in, in their cheeks. Uh, but you know, who the heck blows into the cheek? So those are typical color faults. Uh, next. Okay, I'm not going to read all this stuff to you because we got to kind of move along a little bit. I think um, there's going to be a change for every broken standard, no matter what the breed. If you've got a broken variety in your breed, you're going to disqualify for booted rabbits. You're going to disqualify for Charlie rabbits. Um, the language in the top box is actually the language that will appear in the mini set and broken description. Uh, the next box down is the, um, what appears in the definition section in the upcoming a standard of perfection, uh, defining what a broken looks like, what a Charlie looks like. And then the, the SOP also has a general DQ section, and that's a third box down. The bottom line for breeders, I think, is that um, just don't breed these things. I mean, you can. You can breed Charlies to booted rabbits and get, gets, you know, get some decent broken rabbits. Um, you can breed uh, Charlies to solids and get some um, you know, decent broken rabbits. But heck, it's so easy to come across good brokens. Why bother? Um, don't keep those patterns with lots of scattered white hairs in them. That's a, a modifier, and you can breed that into your herd uh, pretty quickly. And don't keep that lousy ear color that I'm showing you there on the, in the lower uh, right-hand picture. Uh, bottom line, in strong competition, um, you're going to have to have good solid colored patterns to, to win it. Uh, next. Um, this is an otter color change, and I'm going to go over this real quickly. It's just going to fault for a lack of um, slate blue or, or a lack of uh, the undercolor as called for in the variety uh, description. The variety descriptions are on the bottom for undercolor black, blue, chocolate, and lilac. Um, the belly undercolor, that's the language that actually appears in the standard and the fault that appears in the standard. And uh, the two pictures on the left are correct. The two pictures on the right are wrong. Uh, there's no undercolor on the right pictures. And good undercolor on the, on the left side. Next uh, slide. This is copper color. And again, we talked, uh, talked a little bit earlier about um, it being a complicated color. It is. I mean, it's got a uh, base, you know, a base band, an intermediate band, uh, two little bands in the upper color. Um, the surface color is a mixture of two or three different colors. Um, so it's, it's a complex color, but again, 10 points on colors. So um, try not to make it 25, whether you're a breeder or a judge. Um, if you get real wound up about the color uh, and forget about type and fur, you're, you're headed in the wrong direction. Again, that's a picture of that wide band. That's the belly in the upper left-hand picture. That's what the belly looked like looks like of that rabbit in the lower left-hand picture. Um, and then of course there's good copper color in the lower right hand. So next slide. Uh, condition, the final 10 points is on condition. Um, the stuff in the upper box is <clears throat> um, language from the standard. Um, the rabbit in the upper right-hand corner is obviously a, rabbit, a young rabbit, it's not in good condition. Um, Condition, the 10 points is split evenly between flesh and fur. Um, while there's only five points on fur condition, as an example, uh, it's a big deal. Uh, for other reasons, you're going to hear judges talk about uh, loses on condition, loses on condition, loses on condition. And the reason it's a bigger deal in those five points, uh, and just again, looking at fur as an example, um, the texture is going to be uneven on that upper end hand rabbit. The density is going to be uneven. It's going to have a new coat coming in underneath. It's going to be uneven in its density. The color is obviously affected. It's got pretty good color on the sides of the pelt, not very good color across the top of the saddle. Um, the sheen is dull in certain areas. The color is dull in certain areas. 
Um, the length is different because the guard hair is breaking off, new hard guard hair is coming in and so forth. The texture is off in the better part of the pelt. It might feel okay in the, the uh, it'll feel, it won't return to its natural position across the top um, because the coat's standing open too much. So you can see that it's, if the coat's out of condition, you're starting to take fur points off, you're taking color points off and it becomes a much bigger deal than just five points on condition. And then um, the bottom line is that finished rabbits stand out. Uh, finished rabbits will cover, you know, make up for a lot of, you know, a little sin here, a little sin there in terms of type or coat quality. Uh, the rabbit that um, David's showing you there on the, the broken is a rabbit, the coat's a little bit too thin. Uh, you can see um, skin in the crease when it's stroked from the hind quarter of the front. You can see some skin down there. It returns really quickly. Uh, partly because it's thin, partly because the guard hair has a little bit too much strength to it. So you're almost getting a flyback coat there. Um, and that's not the proper coat uh, quality uh, for the breed. Next slide. Culling. So the last couple things I want to talk about is just from a breeder standpoint, culling, a little bit about culling. Um, I start my culling process about six to eight weeks. That's too young to cull for anything except for something that's really gross, like, you know, like a broken leg or the, the rabbit's blind or something. Um, but I think it's critically important to begin handling rabbits at about six to eight weeks and handle them a lot so they get tamed down. Um, I pulled one out of a cage uh, earlier today to take just a picture of a head to put in this um, slideshow and the thing screamed at me for about two minutes and would not sit on the table. I had to literally hold it down to take its picture. Um, you can't evaluate rabbits when they're behaving like that. Um, so get them out six to eight weeks, just handle them a bunch. It gives you a chance to set them up. And you train them to pose because it's critically important that they pose calmly uh, and properly uh, when it comes time to pose. I first call it eight to 10 weeks. That's the first call. They've got to be able to, you've got to be able to pose them consistently. That's probably the most critical thing. You can manipulate the top line. You can manipulate the way the hind quarter looks um, by changing the pose from one rabbit to another. And that's not going to help you pick the best rabbit. You got to pose them consistently and correctly. Um, you don't want to overpose them. I see a lot, of, <laughs> see folks all the time trying to punch them up and you know, exaggerate the depth and so forth. Um, some judges will do that. A lot of judges won't do that. Your job as a breeder is to come up with a rabbit that looks good in the right pose, in a relaxed pose where the front feet are resting lightly, you know, under the, under the eye and the front of the back feet are right in front of that hip bone. And you can tap them around the, the base of the hind quarter a little bit, get them to tense up and they look a little bit better. But, um, exaggerating the pose is going to have you keeping the wrong rabbits because you're, it changes where the top line you know, peaks. It changes how the hind quarter looks. You can hide a shoulder fault by punching them up like that. So don't overpose them. In terms of culling, it's loin first. Um, and you may talk to people who have a different opinion, but my opinion is the loin sets everything up. It sets up the top line. It sets up roundness through the hip. Um, that loin has to be, even at 10 weeks, has to be sitting up above the hips so that when you put your hand over the top of the loin and use your fingers just to touch the top of that hip bone, you've got to have a loin in your hand up above the hip bone. And the deeper that loin is, the deeper your top line is going to be uh, ultimately when that rabbit grows up. And that sets it up. It's not the only thing that's important, but I think it's the most critical thing. It's going to set up the roundness of that loin is deep and full and blends into the hip well. You're going to have nice roundness up over the top of the rabbit. Um, the next thing down is taper and kind of fullness of the hind quarter. Um, the taper certainly has to be right. If the you can tolerate a little bit of narrowness in the shoulder with these rabbits, sometimes they will widen out a little bit in the front end. Their heads develop like dwarves do, and then their heads will get a little bit thicker over time. They might, you know, come out. They don't always uh, widen out in the shoulder. You can't count on that. 
um, but sometimes they do. Uh, you can't have an extreme taper at this age because those rabbits will, won't come back into balance. Um, it's better to keep a deep rabbit and give up a little fullness at the base of the hind quarter than to keep a flat rabbit and have a full base of the hind quarter. Um, you're going to get beat with a rabbit like that consistently. Um, you can win a lot of classes with a deep rabbit that's not quite full enough at the base. And then, of course, weigh them. Um, you know, if they're well over three pounds at uh, 10 weeks, they're going to be too big. Um, if their ears are over three and a quarter, three, three and a quarter inches at that age, uh, they're going to push the maximum ear length and they're going to be a bigger, bigger bone, longer rabbit. Um, and you're going to have a tough time winning with one of those. So next slide. So culling fur, fur is actually a little more predictable. Um, I don't know if it has less variables or if, uh, I'm not sure what the deal is, but you can actually tell more about the fur at eight to 10 weeks than you can about the type sometimes. The first rule of thumb is that good fur produces good fur. So if you're starting out with breeding stock that don't have good quality fur, you're starting out in a hole. Uh, you've got to have brood stock that has good fur uh, the chances of putting two rabbits together with bad fur and getting good furred rabbit, uh, good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> buy a lottery ticket and you get about a, the same amount of chance of getting a really good rabbit. Um, good fur is primarily genetic. Uh, certainly good health and feed will make a difference. You can ruin good fur with bad feed and uh, bad housing conditions and a lousy water. Uh, you know, and that really affects the health of the rabbit. You can certainly ruin good fur, but um, you can enhance them a little bit with feed, not a whole lot. It's primarily a genetics game. Um, you have to have the genes um, in order to get the good fur. Um, and again, your brood stock, your brood stock has to have good fur um, or you're starting out in a hole. I think rabbits have to be finished at eight to 10 weeks. If they aren't finished at 10, eight to 10 weeks, good luck uh, having a mature rabbit that's got a good coat of fur. It can happen, but it's a crapshoot. Uh, rabbits that finish at eight to 10 weeks, you've got a way better chance of them having really good fur uh, over time. Um, it's just a real, it's a real leg up. And then in terms of keepers, you want, of course, your finest textured, most dense, most uniform coats at that age. They are not going to be, and a 10-week-old um, coat of fur is not going to be as good as that first junior prime when they're four and a half to five months, but four and a half to five and a half months old. And it's not going to be as good as that, that first big, uh, you know, senior prime that they get a little bit later than that. But um, they can still have very fine texture. You can have some density on them and some uniformity of length. Of course, you don't want any serious color faults in the coat. Um, but again, if it's within the range of color, then give it a chance to develop. And then you're looking for those wash and wear coats. Those rabbits that finish at eight to 10 weeks and stay finished through their senior, through seniors. And when they molt, they just slip a coat and you barely notice. Those are the rabbits you want to keep for brood stock, for one thing. They are also the best show rabbits. You can show them much longer, uh, far more frequently. Those coats hold up over time, and that's really the ideal. Um, but the very best show rabbits ultimately that you're going to have have very nice coats as youngsters. Uh, if they're eight to ten weeks old and they've got a bad coat of fur, it's all under coat, or it's you know there's zero density, or it's too long. Um, those coats are unlikely to come back into balance. Next slide. Hey, um, there's only two slides left. There you go. Um, so some advice. Uh, first of all, uh, my advice is to join the breed club, uh, the American Sat Rabbit Breeders Association. You can do that from their website. You can find them pretty easily either through the ARBA website link or through just by um, doing a search for the American Sat Rabbit Breeders. I think the club has a great culture. I think that's one of the reasons I've stayed in it for 45 years. Um, people help each other. Um, I just think it's a great culture. It's easy to get some help. It's easy, uh, it's easy to buy rabbits from most people. 
Um, you get a guidebook uh, with the membership and they're just about to print a brand new one. That's very, very close, been promised for a long time, but, but I know it's coming because I helped to write a, a little bit of it. Um, the second bit of advice is obtain a standard. If you don't have a standard and you're trying to breed these rabbits and trying to compete with other people, um, other breeders, uh, you need to know what the rules are. Uh, you need to know what you're breeding to. Uh, certainly obtain a standard of perfection, that's a big deal. Find a mentor, find somebody that'll help you through things. I've, I've been so lucky. I've had uh, so many great mentors uh, over time. I mean, you can learn so much from, just so much from reading or checking things out online, but there's nothing like having somebody that'll work with your hands on either at a show or in your rabbitry, or you can go to their rabbitry. One thing I like about uh, this club is that the top readers are approachable. You can, uh, uh, you can approach just about anybody. So don't be shy about that. Go ask people questions and go interact with them. Um, be real careful buying rabbits uh, online from photographs. Um, I can tell you just from putting this presentation together that you can manipulate the heck out of what a rabbit looks like by uh, narrowing the picture, widening the picture. Um, uh, you can Photoshop pictures. Uh, and again, when you're punching up those top lines and, and getting just a certain angle taking a picture, um, you might be able to take a fabulous picture of a rabbit that really doesn't look quite so fabulous when it shows up at your house. So be careful um, buying, you know, buy from people that have been around a while. Um, again, get a mentor, uh, ask your mentor, you know, uh, how you should be obtaining rabbits. And if you can't buy them in person. So next slide, I think it's the last one. Yep, I just wanted to say thank you to a, to a few people. I took a number of these photographs off the website off, uh, you know, different um, web websites. And in some cases, I don't know who they belong to. Um, but I know Joe and Amanda, Joe Kim and Amanda Wapner put on a, a great presentation on uh, a top line at the RabbitCon in 2019 at the convention. And um, uh, Joe gave me permission to use a couple of slides in this uh, presentation. Sandra White, photography of course, takes pictures at all of our conventions. Uh, she is um, one of the editors of our domestic rabbit publication. She's a wonderful photographer. And uh, I had access to a lot of pictures because, uh, partly because I'm on the standard committee and I got to sort through a lot of pictures. So I got to use a couple of those. And then there's a top line face group. And I think I used some pictures uh, off of that as well. And of course, the American Satin Rabbit Breeders website and guidebook. So just wanted to say thanks to those people. Apologize to anybody I missed. Uh, and that's the presentation, David. Excellent. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I do have a few questions for you. Uh -huh. um, from your judging experience, I know that you've judged them uh, several times, like at the national level. What has been one of your favorite classes or like a favorite rabbit, uh, like from your judging experience and why? Oh, wow. Um... Almost every time I judge a national show, that it's a highlight. It'd be hard to pick uh, between those. It's just, um, I mean, I've, I've been really fortunate to be able to do every convention since I got my license. Um, probably a couple of the biggest throw classes were, were not satins or mini satins. I actually declined to breed the, to judge those a lot of times because I like to show the rabbits at the convention. That's a big part of why. I, stay in the hobby, but um, I remember some years ago, I think it was in Louisville, I did the junior white New Zealand classes and they both had over a hundred rabbits in them. And um, boy, that was, that was a thrill right till I got to the first place rabbit and the ear number didn't match. <laughs> that wasn't so much fun. I remember that for that reason. I remember judging uh, at a national set show in, um, gosh, I think it was Texas. And uh, maybe one of the best sads I've ever touched in my life. It belonged to R.C. Crow. It was a senior buck, I think. Senior 6'8 buck. Beautiful rabbit. Uh, he put it in the auction. It went for a big bunch of money. I needed a buck about six months later. And I tried to find that rabbit. I would have paid any amount of money for it. 
Um, but the person had already left the rabbits and kind of the rabbit had disappeared. So I never got a chance to get it. Um, but almost every time I do national shows, I, here are the highlights. I love sorting through the top end rabbits that the very best breeders in the country bring to that show. Along the lines of you being a, an exhibitor, I mean, you have a ton of outstanding mini satins. I know recently you won best of breed in the 2018 convention. What, yeah. what does that rabbit look like? I mean, I, and I know you described a lot of that in the presentation, but I mean, like all the features, you know, together, what, what does that rabbit ultimately look like? I think there might be a picture of it in the slideshow, but I, it, I'd be hard pressed to tell you which slide it is. It was a blue otter. Um, it was a senior doe. She had a wonderfully finished coat of fur. If I see her, I'll stop you. She had a wonderfully finished coat of fur that had some density to it. Um, she was a dilute. Uh, so she had that really nice dilute texture right there. Um, she's a little older in that picture and the picture makes her look like she has a little bit longer hair than she really does. Um, but she was super finished. It, it was her day to show. Um, and she's a real deep, short coupled, really a deep shouldered rabbit um, filled at the base, which is hard to do when you get a real deep rabbit like that. And uh, I know several of the judges um, went back and forth and back and forth um, picking that rabbit we had, uh, but um, I love her. Uh, she's, a, she's turning out to be a pretty good herd though too. I'm getting a lot of lilac rabbits out of her, which is, interesting um, but very pretty rabbit very very good I, i'm gonna uh end the recording okay